Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We've got our bigger brother from another mother, David Cho, in the house. Every, everybody knows him. We, re we recorded hours worth of uh, conversation with, uh, <laughs> with with Cho already, man. W welcome back to Kayfabe, dude. Thanks, guys. I missed you guys. I love you guys. Um, I'm in my car right now because it's chaos in my house. So I wanted to uh, take comics seriously. Um, I'll show you right now. You guys know what date it is, right? What date it is? What day it is. Oh, yeah. What day is it? Wednesday? New, oh, new, new comics, comics day. day. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So if you look right here, there's my local comic store that I'm sitting outside, which is opening in one minute. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you guys are eating into my valuable comic book uh, Wednesday. I go to four comic book stores on Wednesday. I go to Mega City One, which opens at 10. And, and then I go to Golden Apple, which opens at 11. And then I hit uh, Secret Headquarters and, and uh, Revenge of... Uh, after I pick up my kids. That makes me so, so happy to hear, man. Mega City One gets the lion's share of my money, so I'll just do a shout-out to the comic book stores out there. You're in Los Angeles. You're competing with, like, there's, there's probably, like, 10 comic book stores, if not more, and they all open at 11 or 12. Like, the people that are buying comic books have money. They got jobs to go to and shit. Like, open at 7, just on Wednesday. <laughs> I get it. Open, you, you're running a comic store. You open whenever you want. But just on Wednesday, open fucking early. Like, it's... Anyway, there's that. Let's let's break kayfabe a little bit, man, because the, the plan initially was going to be, let's get let's get Uncle Jeff on the hook, Uncle Jeff Darrow. Let's get our big brother, yeah. Dave Cho, on the hook and, and see what that's like. International kayfabe. But Jeff in France, <laughs> Cho, Cho on the West. We're here in the Midwest. <laughs> And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you, Dave. Like like uh, with the, the plan I had, if we got uh, Jeff yeah. Darrow, which which I still would like to do, if if uh, if we can yes, make that make that happen. That. But uh, we we were gonna try to just like convince you to like grease the palms of like whatever kind of like yakuza dudes or like administration in in, in Japan <laughs> to like expunge yeah. your record because you come up in conversation every time we're out there. I spent probably a good month and a half with Jeff over the course of two trips. Running around Tokyo, yeah. fucking buying crazy shit, and you come up all the time, dude. It's like, yeah, man, I wish Cho was here too. Wow, yeah, I definitely wish I was. I, I'm so jealous uh, seeing the photos and everything. So yes, I will. I will definitely grease the yakuza palms. But first, I want to grease you guys up because you guys. I, I say this to you guys privately, but I want to say it on the record. Uh, and I, I, I have talked to you guys off the air and all that. The service that you provide, I know the new word is edutainment. It's educational and entertaining. You provide such an insane, like, I don't, you're so important to my world. And, and the, the things you talk about, I'm like, that's entertaining, this and that. But I go, it's important because if you didn't do it, no one else is doing it. Like, literally no one. There's other podcasts. There's other people talking about comics. But the level of detail and the serious, and that's, uh, you know, when I used to do journalism, my, my, my focus was always take super serious things really stupid. Like if I'm going to North Korea, do burger reviews out there, and then take really stupid things like Batman and, uh, uh, well, and then take really, sorry, I'm getting confused, I'm nervous. Take really serious things and treat it like stupid, and then take really stupid things like Batman and and elevate it and make it and really serious. So the fact that you guys do like you know two three hour long in depth reviews of Wizard magazine and comic books I've never heard of and just it's it's I don't know like I can't even imagine a world without kayfabe. So I just want to say. You guys are, you, you know, especially during the pandemic, but like even after you guys saved my life, you guys are, are providing a, a great, great service because without what you guys are doing, it's just gone. No one knows who the fuck, uh, you know, Brian Ralph or Paul Pope or weird manga artists or, you know, Matsumoto and all that. So I just want to say hats off to you guys. I love you guys. And it's it's just a great great service, and and so anytime I have a chance to talk to you guys uh, on air, off the air, I love it. And so my experience with kayfabe, you know, I'm being honest with you guys. My first time you guys asked me, still some of that old shame from I'm a I'm a nerd and I don't really want to.
fly my comic flag, my freak flag, let everyone know that I'm in. Everyone knows I'm into this shit, but not how, you know. And uh, I sat with that for a second. I was like, fuck that. I'm definitely talking to you guys. But since I've done that, my, my comic book experience when I used to live in New York was I go in and I get into heated debates at Jim Hanley's or whoever's there. But that's not so much in L.A. In L.A., you go in, you buy your comics, you leave. You don't really talk to anybody. And my world, my community, my connection with the comics community, just because of you guys, has grown. Like, I've gotten talking to Frank Miller. I, I can literally say I'm friends with Jeff Darrow now. Like, we talk all the time. Um, I, I'm getting invited to Joe Manganello's house where, uh, you know, <laughs> Sofia Vergara's, like, serving us charcuterie plates while we're playing D&D. And I've got to meet all these amazing comic book artists through through just, you know, being on kayfabe so uh, i just want to say thank you i'm very grateful for you guys and and i'm really happy to be here today but yes um one of the most bizarre like it's just like an out-of-body experience is because of you guys um you know i got to you know one of the things is i got to inter interview frank miller which you know we did a whole thing on that jeff darrow hears that reaches out because of that kayfabe episode we start texting, and, and now every time I get off the phone with him, I'm like, I can't believe I'm fucking talking to Jeff Darrow. This is insane. This guy is literally the best drawer I've ever seen in my life. And he's so, he always calls me sir. He's so humble. And, um, and uh, you know, he, he lives in France. Actually, I moved to Portugal recently, so we're more on the same uh, sleep schedule, so we talk more often. And I talk to him, text with him every week. I talk to him once in a while. And, and and when he was in L.A., he said, uh, hey, you know, my daughter Alice, you know, who's also an artist, is a huge fan. Is there any way I feel weird asking, like, you want to meet up in person? I was like, are you fucking kidding me? This is fucking crazy. And they live they live uh, near my parents in Glendale. So I go over there, and Alice is sweet. Jeff is a sweetheart. And I just see their relationship. And, you know, I have my own kids. So I'm like, oh, how, how like, how do you... How do you exist in a world if you're a kid and your dad's Jeff Darrow and you want to hang out with him? And he's like, he's like, just like the, he's like I got to draw this screw on this a hair on the screw on this thing on this. It's, um, so she just sat, she, you know, she told me her story of what it was like to have Jeff Darrow as her dad. And, and I, and I, and I did this with, uh, and you know, he's telling me these unbelievable Mobius stories. And I did this thing with Frank Miller where, uh, when I met him, I, I asked him if he would if he would be down to draw with his non-dominant hand, like blindfolded, you know. And I that to me that's one of my favorite drawings I've ever, you know. He drew Batman, and I go here's Jeff who I don't know, uh, you know I know him better now, but in the beginning when I first met him in person, I go I I'm guessing this guy has some level of OCD, some level of like extreme control freak just from his art. And uh, I asked him, hey, are you down to do this also? And so I have a sketchbook full of a bunch of sketches that Jeff did with his daughter where it's non-dominant hand. I forgot if I blindfolded him. I got to find those. But, you know, those also are like some of my most treasured uh, paintings and drawings. Um, so, yeah, when you guys said let's, uh, you know, you guys are sending me um, photos from Japan, I get fucking so jealous. I'm... I'm closer to getting in. For those of you who don't know, I, I was a bad boy. I I got into a lot of trouble 20 plus years ago. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 I can get in, but it's a, it's a long process. So I'm working on this it. This video is brought to you by the comics that we make. Ed Piscor's Switchblade Shorties is now available daily on all of our social media and all of Ed's social media. You can follow that wherever you want to read your comics. Red Room Crypto Killers, the latest and third volume in the Red Room trilogy is now available. However, you can start at any of these books because they are all self-contained. Hip Hop Family Tree, the omnibus, collecting all four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree plus 150 extra pages. Now available wherever you buy books and X-Men Grand Design, the trilogy trade paperback, kind of the mass market version of X-Men Grand Design, collecting all three volumes in one volume. Hulk Grand Design, out of print on the Treasury Size Edition, Coming soon as a trade paperback. Pre-order that one now. 
Street Angel Princess of Poverty and Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive collect all of my Street Angel comics in two handsome volumes. You can get those wherever books are bought and sold. And my self-publishing efforts, True Crime Funnies, BW Zine, and 1986 Zine are all available on jimrug.com or patreon.com slash jimrug. And now back to our video. So, so when we were in uh, Tokyo, uh, one of the times that you came up in conversation, Jeff was talking about that. And he said, uh, just while you guys were making uh, chit-chat, you asked Jeff if he had any kind of social life whatsoever. And Alice yeah. like starts laughing. You know, the, the daughter's <laughs> like, oh, please. Yeah. And I don't know if I've um, brought this up before on Kayfabe before, but I'll, if I did, I'll say it again. I'm friends with a lot of artists, you know, like from a lot of different worlds, the fine art world, the graffiti world, you know, muralist, comic book artists. And, um, and uh, whenever I, I might be exaggerating right now, but most of the time when I call them, it, I, I get off the phone call and I, and we always have like very deep, meaningful conversations. They go hour plus, And at the end I go, uh, Hey motherfucker, you can call me too. <laughs> right. And there's always a feeling of, I think a lot of artists carrying this, which is, I don't want to bother you, right? Some of it is like, I'm busy, I'm doing my own shit, but it's also, that's the, that's the life of, especially comic book artists, is they're usually pale, bad posture, and you go into this cocoon of like, I'm in my world, so there there isn't much of a social life, and, and uh, that's sad, you know, and that's why I think it's also... Uh, so important what you guys are doing because there's conversations that are that are that you guys spark now you guys will talk about something and then i'm on like all these different comic book uh text chains now where i'm like did you see the new kayfabe and then oh yeah and then it'll spark all these conversations but you know the connection part is is very important i i i feel like and yeah i don't most of the really really great artists that i know that are like amazing they don't have any friends or they have friends but they don't kick it with them they don't see them and i'll i'll have to take like field trips out to their house and you know i'm bringing you bringing you some cookies and a home care package or something so um there's uh you know I, i'm not i'm not like trying to claim i'm a therapist or anything but i can't help but see I feel we're talking about Trap and he's not here, but I'll, I, we'll do 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 it with him one day. Um, is there's no way someone draws like that without like severe abuse? I make up, right? I I, I I'll go to a comic book store and uh, I don't want to compare Eric Larson to Jeff Dare. I don't know Eric Larson, but the fact that he's on issue 300 of Savage Dragon and I don't know a person who reads it, but he's still doing it. I'm like, that's some, that's some kind of mental illness. That's some OCD shit. Like who the fuck is reading Savage Dragon? Once in a while, I'll just grab it just because I'm like, fuck yeah, dude, keep going. But I'm like, that's some, that's some Asperger's on the spectrum shit. Um, I don't know Eric Larson. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Um, but when I see Jeff's work and it's just, you know, it, it, it looks the same now as it did 20 years ago. There's no, this guy's going hard and you don't draw like that unless there's a fire in you and there's, and, and you would never get that talking to him. He's the sweetest guy. He's like a teddy bear, but there's, there's, there, you don't draw like that without some kind of severe trauma and anger being like, I need a fucking show everyone in the whole fucking world that literally nobody's going to draw better than me. And I, obviously, I'm just projecting all this shit. And then, you know, so I told this to Jeff when I met him in front of his daughter. He's like, oh, yeah, you want to hear some stories? And I'll, 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 I'll wait till that episode for him to tell. But yeah, you don't you don't draw like that without some fucked up shit happening. You know, dude, when we were uh, preparing for this conversation, I'm like, you know, it's been a it's been a while since I since I watched Dirty Hands. Uh, <laughs> and, and then there was the other one called like High Risk or something that that Harry put together. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like some of the same footage. It kind of overlaps, but then there's more on high risk or whatever. And whenever I watch the, these pieces, I'll be honest with you, like like I'm drawn. So I'm working, and then I'm like looking right. over and checking it out. And then there will right. be this part where, yeah, there's this old bald white dude talking about how great Dave Cho is as a student and stuff. And you see that archetype in these kinds of documentaries where it's like, for most people, it's like 
the the failed teacher, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach right. kind of shit. Right. And it's like, well, I don't give a fuck what some like hack teacher has to say about like the best student that they ever had. Like that doesn't means nothing. And then I'm like, oh, that's Baron's story. Baron's story was <laughs> Dave Cho's fucking teacher. Let us yeah. know, man. How, how, like, what what was that like? Because as soon as I saw that, I'm like, I could draw those connections now a little bit, man. There's there's some spiritual similarities there. Yeah, I mean, Baron is Baron's my fucking god. So he was my uh, he was my counselor or at uh, California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland, which they've changed. It's in San Francisco now, and they got rid of the crafts part. I think it's design, and I don't know. I, 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 I don't need to go into my like basically my life at ccac was identical to art school confidential and and dan Klaus was like you know right down the street on shattuck so i just you know i i imagine that he either took classes there or somewhere i mean it was it was identical there was the guy that drew the thor <laughs> barbarian <laughs> shit, guy that brought in like a piece of shit and so this is my and and that's just not i was ignorant i didn't know what to expect i had just i had just uh I had just lived in, in the Gaza Strip, you know, 90, 94, 95 in the Intifada. I was out there. I had just been like, I, I was mentally ill. I, I, I'd been chasing a dinosaur in the Congo. And, you know, that was my year off after high school. And I just came home and I just was just, I just, I, I, I didn't even know what to do with my life. I, I was, uh, I think I was, uh, I think I was like, shell shocked or PTSD. I'd just seen I'd seen so much death and war and insanity and and I just came home and I just was like out of my mind. So I was uh nineteen then. What what are you at the end of high school? Eighteen so I was nineteen and I come home and my brother's like, Bro, I think we're rich. <laughs> and I said, What? And my mom had just, you know, we had lost everything had burned down during the LA riots in ninety two. And my mom started selling this Herbalife multi multi level marketing vitamin system, and she just rose to the top really quick in in two three years. So then my mom says, uh, "I have enough money for you to go to art school." And I said, uh, "I don't know. Okay, sure. I mean, art school back then. I'm trying to remember. It was like twenty grand, thirty grand, which just seems like a you know now I think it's like forty or fifty grand, something like that." And I said, "Oh shit! All right." So I go to art school, and in my mind. You know, just like you guys, I, I had been the best drawer in my class, right? Like all through elementary school, everyone's like, Dave's the guy that can draw. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to the Super Bowl. Like now I'm going to be at a institution where my mother's paying $20,000 and um, it's the best drawer from every high school, right? And I get there and there's a, a girl like, you know, with the, she shoots red paint in her pussy and starts squirting it on a canvas. Ah! And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And and uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever had was, uh, you know, I, I don't know who Baron Story is. I take his illustration class, but I take it like, I'm like, this is every assignment. I'm going to do my best. So I think the first assignment I drew, John from the Book of Revelation sitting on the toilet, scratching uh, uh, the Book of Revelations onto a, like a toilet like a like a stall a public restroom and i just took i don't know i was working on this thing with a tiny rapidograph pen like day and night and it was my our first assignment so i was like i want to come in like just like and i came in and three i remember their names too i won't say it but i remember three kids quit that day because they're like if that's what we're competing with then there's no point of us being in this class and i was like yeah bitch get the fuck out of here um and they did the thing. I forgot. It wasn't Baron, but it was another illustration teacher. He broke it down by minutes. He's like, art school's 20 grand. So every minute is like this many dollars. And da 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 da. Most of you are not going to make it. 90% of you are not going to make your money back. You know, that whole thing. So I get I get to art school and I, I everyone's just talking about Baron Stories here. Baron Stories, the head of the illustration department. And I go, who's this guy? I don't know who he is. And then like, you know, Bill Sinkovich, uh, uh, Dave McKean, all these guys are like, they stop by and they're like, God, you know, he's the God, you know, he's not as well known as them, but he's, 
you know and so all these like top illustrators uh, eric white everyone shows up and they're like baron's god and so i go I, I gotta take this guy's classes and i didn't think i didn't have any faith in myself i didn't think uh you know so if you finish four years of art school and most people take five years i didn't think i would ever sell a painting or paintings in my life that would equal a hundred grand where i would i would be i'll be in debt for the rest of my life so i wasn't able to take baron's um illustration classes until i was like a junior or, or senior and i was like i don't think i'm gonna make it so being the the entitled uh criminal that i am i planned on dropping out especially because my mom's business was starting to fail again that's the life of living with you know a uh, 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 woman who takes a lot of chances I, I get that from her you know very high risk behavior <laughs> so I, I figure, okay, I'll do a year and a half of art school. What? Wh how can I get the most bang for my buck? I quickly learn how to forge Baron Story signature, and I'm taking his senior level uh, illustration classes while I'm uh, a freshman, and we just bro the fuck out immediately. I mean, he just, you know, we get assignments, and then I wouldn't do it on illustration board. I would do it on the billboard outside. <laughs> I'd be like showing off, hey class, for my second, like everyone walk outside. And people are like, that's illegal. And Baron would be like, this is my guy. This is my guy. And, you know, I just, there's like, he would bring his fucking illustrations, like the cover for Lord of the Flies, just things that, and he just didn't treat them like, he would just throw it on the ground and go, everyone check it out. And they're grubby mitts picking it up. And you're just seeing the depths of layering. And, and, and I just really took to it. And, and the problem with, uh, having someone so influential like Baron Stories, if you take it, like, if you go to his class, e every student looks like they're just copying him. It all looks like Dave McKean clones, Bill Sinkovich wannabes, you know? Um, so it, it was, a, and you know, most of my life, not just in my art, I've just been a poser. Like, I'm a poser. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know how, like, with comedy, uh, back in the day before social media, there's all this joke stealing, right? You go to a comedy club, there's a comedian you never heard of, and they say something hilarious, and you're like, okay, I'm going to steal that joke. There's so much of that in, uh, in in comic book art, right? There's so much, oh, that pose is from a Neil Adams thing, or this and that, and um, I, just, uh, I, just, I just was able to copy, I guess this is a humble brag, but I can pretty much draw like any artist if I want to, um, except for maybe Chris Ware. Um, <laughs> but um, so in that in that thing, you know, in the beginning, it's like I'm kind of drawing like Todd McFarlane, a little bit like Art Adams, a little bit like Baron Story. Then I go into my Kent Williams phase and this and that. And it's like, who am I? You know, who am I? And then and somewhere in there, I just found myself. But, well, I'm still searching, you know, it's a work in progress. But, uh, you know, I know people say stupid shit like that guy's my spirit animal. But Baron Story, you know, if you ever meet him, He's got like the deepest voice and on his drawing arm, his fucking forearm is that much bigger than his other arm. Cause <laughs> the guy is, you know, when you look at a sketchbook page and you could see how, how hard they write and you look at the other side. I mean, this guy's fucking putting it down. And I was just so inspired by him. And, um, and uh, yeah, I love Baron and Baron. I, I talked to him. I, 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 I came clean to him. I said, Hey bro, I, I, I forged your signature and everything. And he goes, I know. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, I don't I don't have any money. I'm going to drop out. And he's like, he's like, uh, what did he say to me? He said, you're going to be fine because, you you know, you already know what you're doing. Just keep at it. But also you're like giving out really, really dangerous advice to people because you're you're making this assumption that a lot of people are like fearless like you. And that's not the case. And you're going to get some some people killed. Like people. <laughs> He's like, people shouldn't be doing their homework on a billboard hanging upside down, you know? Uh, so he, he gave me the confidence uh, to, 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 to leave. And then, you know, because I got my Asian parents on this side saying, you have to, you have to finish school. You have to get a degree. And I, I said, I don't know how the world works yet, but I'm pretty sure nobody gives a fuck about an art degree they're not going to ask for that when you're getting a job and and they never did and actually maybe two years after i dropped out and i started you know getting published and stuff they actually asked me to come back and teach at that school 
during, for the summer program. And I was like, mom. And she was still like, uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get that degree. You gotta get that. It's very, you know, immigrant mentality. I was like, mom, they're asking me to teach at the fucking school. And she's like, it doesn't matter. You need that. You need that piece of paper. You need that piece of paper. And then finally, you know, you know, cut to 10 years later, multimillionaire. I'm like, look at this paper. And she's like, okay, you don't got to, you don't got to get the degree anymore. Okay. It's fine now. So money, money, money talks, um, with Asian parents for sure. You remember anything specific you took out of the Baron story? You know, that, that the, the classes that you took with him, anything specific that you still think about whenever you face a blank page? Uh, absolutely. The first of all, triangles, like the guy draws more triangles than anybody. And, and, um, uh, just the drafts, his draftsmanship. Like I used to draw more, like I didn't put any thought into it. I'd have a white piece of paper and I would just draw an eyeball and then everything would form around that eyeball and then the head. And I wouldn't like do any drafting or, or laying out any shapes or any of that. And, you know, I know it's something that I, I've, I've been saying it to my kids. And, and when I teach classes, like there's no such thing as mistakes. And with him, that was, he would just put it down. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like he would just, to me, he was like a magician. Like he, the, the confidence because he drew so much and, and and this is what I get with why I do these exercises when I meet someone like Frank Miller or, or Jeff Darrow is like, when you draw that much, you can draw with your eyes closed. You can draw with your fucking dick hole. You can draw with your foot. Like you don't need, you've been drawing so much. The muscle memory is just there. And, and so he, he was just, I guess more than anything, the actual drawing was there. He is. Still there? Yes, sir. You guys still there? Yes, sir. You hear us? Uh, holy shit. Sorry about that. So, um, oh, good. So, um, I was parked in the sun. So, my phone just died and said, or it didn't die, it said, uh, too hot. Overheated. Yeah, so I just drove to, I don't know if you guys ever done a driving interview, but I just drove into the shade. So, hopefully, it's okay now. What? Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. You were about to reveal the the drawing. Baron's story said. Oh, uh, uh, shit! What was I saying? Yeah. So, more than drawing, more than um, any specific technique, and he had so many techniques. He used the shit out of uh, wash and white out, and you know, just the layering, just within a drawing. Sometimes you go through his um, sketchbook, and his sketchbooks wouldn't close because they're so thick, and he would collage, and it was a real like. It was a real departure from like Adrian Tomine, Dan Klaus, Chris Ware, you know, which I like all their stuff also. But here's like this school of thought where you draw like this and and just being exposed to so many different. And, 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 and like I said, I was a poser. So trying to be like, who am I? Like, am I a Baron Story guy or am I like in this Seth, you know, Joe Matt category? Am I a uh, Liefeld you know, Todd McFarlane image, and, and I kind of aped all their styles for a little bit, trying to do everything. Um, but more than anything, it was the bravery and the courage to try everything, you know? And, uh, and, and that's just from repetition, right? The more you draw, the more... But then the, the problem with that is then you get stuck, right? And so... Um, I, I don't know. I just... Uh, you know, from the time when you're a kid, just not with art, but with you, it's like, is this cool? Am I cool? Everything's cool, right? Is this cool? Is this cool? Is, does the shoes make me cool? Does this haircut cool or whatever? And so that that extended out to my art of art cool. Does this make me cool? Am I am I cool with the people I want to be cool with, or am I lame, or am I a poser? And and then at, at, until I got to the point in the Matrix where I'm like, okay. I don't need anyone to tell me that I'm cool anymore. Like either I just know I'm cool or I'm not cool or be a, a cool, be cool with not being cool and accepting that. Do I, do I like it? Do I like this art? And, and I do these days. I, I you know, I, I would paint things and draw things back in the day where everyone was telling me it was awesome. This is dope. This is awesome. And I would go, I fucking hate it. And I wasn't, it wasn't a put on or anything. I, I really, 
I really didn't think I liked it. I really, and now I, I paint stuff that people are like, that's dog shit. Or my three year old could do that. And I go, I don't care. Like, I love it. I think it's amazing. And people go, Oh, let me see your sick ass, sick ass art collection. And I, I do have a sick ass art collection, but I'll show them this, you know, uh, retarded looking dinosaur that Jeff Darrow, Darrow drew with his non-dominant hand with his eye, one eye closed. And that's my favorite. They're like, yeah, you're just trying to be weird. I go, no, I love this. I drew this with Jeff and his daughter at this special time in my life. And I love this fucking drawing. So. Yeah. That's, you know. that's super cool, man. When, whenever, uh, when the Baron story thing came up, it made me think like, First off, I went and I'm like, what, what is his bibliography like? Like, what all has he done? Because like we know, we know his influence on McKean. And whenever you say, "Oh, that's Bill Sienkiewicz style," you're really saying it's Baron Story style. And he yeah, did he did absolutely. that thing with Neil Gaiman, the, the, that Sandman thing. But uh, dude, you guys have a Eastman Laird connection because because uh, his sketchbooks they were published. You know, chunks of them were published by uh, right. Tundra. Tundra. Yeah. So absolutely. that's the Kevin Eastman joint, and you're the uh, Peter Laird guy with the Zero Grit. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I have everything Barron's ever put out, and it's just publishing, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know if actually if anything recently has been out, but just all that stuff from Tundra, he doesn't have a lot of comic book stuff out, and that stuff is really hard. I mean, it's just one of those things, like, when you see a sketchbook in real life, you're, the depth of it is, like, insane, and none of the printings that I've seen have captured that. And, uh, you know, he made his bones mostly with, like, Time Magazine covers, Nat Geo covers, um, you know, book covers. I mean, he was more of an illustrator than a comic book guy. But, yeah, he doesn't have an extensive um, uh, comic book catalog. But, yeah, I, I have all those sketchbooks that Tundra put out. We were um, talking with uh, Paul Pope last, uh, last week, and uh, you and I were in conversation. I guess, I guess like, since... Since uh, since the McFarlane one went live, we, we we were talking a little bit more. You were sending us some some little comics that you've been buying lately and shit. And, and Pope yeah. was like, Pope was like, oh yeah, man, uh, Cho Cho. We all did a signing in in New That's York. Yeah, yeah, and it was like for 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 non or something. And then I realized like like you lived in NYC for a, like a couple of years. Who who were yeah. your who were your, were your people out there, dude? Uh, well. One of my best friends is Rody Montillo. I don't know if you guys seen his comic. It's Pablo's Inferno. It's like back in the day, and he's moved into more children's book like Gum Girl and Cloud Boy and Halloween Kid. Uh, I, I hung out with him every day. Uh, you know, back back in my New York days is when um, when I was doing a lot of stuff for Vice. I mean, that that was like once again, like I. It's it, okay, so. When you, when you're a minority, like these things pop up, and in a way, to me, it, it's like it's like both things, right? It's not black and white. It's like, oh, here's a great opportunity to be in this Asian American zine, or Asian, and you're like, and people will go, here's this guy, the best Asian American artist, in, and I'm like, can I just be an artist? What you know? And I get it. Cool. Thank you for including me in this thing. But everyone in here sucks. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's like, here's the queer comic of all queer. It's like, how about just be a good comic? Here's all. And it's like, cool. I'm glad that it exists to, you know. Um, and so I was doing a lot of shit for Giant Robot back in the day. So I, I had a Asian American audience, which is very small. And... Um, I don't know if this is going to sound racist or weird, uh, but it just is true. You know, when Giant Robot put me on, when I'm doing uh, comics and zines, it's, it's a very small world. And it took a few whites to co-sign me to put me on that, like, and that was Bourdain, that was Joe Rogan, Howard Stern, um, and the guys from Vice, Gavin McInnes, Shane Smith. When those guys are saying Dave Cho is cool, then all of a sudden the floodgates open. Like my world changes when I do Howard Stern and I walk out because it's live. You know, Howard Stern and Joe Rogan, their show, you know, Joe Rogan's not live now, but it used to be live. That's like I do the show. Joe Rogan's in there telling me I'm cool. Howard Stern saying I'm cool. I walk out the studio. All of a sudden my world is a different color, you know? So back then in New York, you know, um, 
time for a story? Let's hear it. <laughs> I got some stories. Okay. Uh, okay, so I did... Um, how am I going to weave this? Okay. <laughs> so I, I did a... a um, I did all this stuff for Giant Robot, and then... Um, actually, I did a book of just drawings called Cursive for Giant Robot, and... Uh, Ralph Bakshi's assistant, or Ralph Bakshi, got that from uh, Giant Robot, or from uh, Golden Apple, and I guess he was working on a cartoon with James Jean, and James Jean was doing all the character designs, and he asked James, hey, do you know this guy, Dave Cho? He's like, I've, I've met him once or twice, so I, um, so he, he calls me, and I, or I had talked to him online, I hadn't met him in person, so I go to his house for the first time, and, and he's like, yeah, Ralph Bakshi wants to do this book, and that was my first like re really like hardcore feelings of jealousy. I'm like this fucking guy like barely out of SVA and he's getting Time Magazine and Rolling Stone and Playboy, you know, like just all the fucking gigs that any, any illustrator wants. And then I was like, oh, cool. He's like, Ralph actually really likes the way you draw buildings, like all shitty and loopy. And and he's, he won he's wondering if you'll do the backgrounds for his new cartoon on Sci-Fi Channel. And the thing never came out, but it was like, Oh, cool. So I had this, like, little things happening like that in L.A. And uh, and then Gavin McInnes at Vice got a hold of uh, some of my stuff. And he's like, hey, will you draw stuff for Vice? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. And, you know, none of these things pay any money, by the way, right? It's like 50 bucks for an illust illustration or something that they never pay you. They're like, so I go to, I, I start sending stuff to Vice and, they're like, hey, you live in Koreatown, right? You know any, you know, you know any Korean gangsters? And I was like, I guess I'm kind of one. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it was just, it just blew my mind because I never had someone have that much confidence in me. So here's this guy at Vice just asking me, like, oh, you can draw. Does that mean you do comics too? And so I did a comic, and and then there was a few issues of Vice in the early days where. I had written like three or four articles in it that all under different names that were all complete bullshit. Like I just made up, like they were all based on some kind of truth, but I just made up the rest. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was crazy. I was doing illustrations, comics and writing the stories. And sometimes they would let me do the cover and it was a fucking insane time. I was hanging out with the guys from vice. I don't do drugs. They were, they were fucking doing tons of drugs getting into fist fights, going out, doing graffiti. So it's that world. And then, um, you know, going to Jim Hanley's where there was a older gentleman, uh, a black guy named, I don't know if I'm pretty sure he's not there anymore, but silver age Larry. And I would just go in there and there's nothing that you could stump him on. You ask him anything about silver age and he would fucking, and, and people would be getting in heated, um, arguments about green lanterns, like wall street guys in ties. And I was like, I fucking love New York, you know, skating down Chinatown, getting some $2 noodles. And then it got cold. It got cold. <laughs> and I was like, and, and, and definitely if no one's ever lived in New York and I don't know what it's like now, Punisher is New York superhero. It's not Daredevil. It's not Spider-Man. If you go to New York, St. Mark's, wherever, any of these like uh, bodegas, they all sell Punisher shirts and everyone like just loves the Punisher and I, I really and I love the Punisher and uh and I I'm just I moved to New York when I was in my 30s and I should have moved there I wanted to move there when I was 19 and so I I, I was already too old to endure a, a New York winter I was like when's it gonna get warm and they're like um in a few months and I said months like <laughs> plural and they're like yeah so I stayed there for a very short time it was just two years and then I I um came back to California and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I was struggling so hard. I couldn't, I could, I couldn't catch a break. I was like, man, fuck James Jean. Fuck this little bitch. Like he just, does, it just came so easy for him. Right. Like, and this isn't like, I'm friends with James. I, I feel very comfortable talking shit behind his back like this. He works very hard. He's one of the hardest working guys. That guy has a lot of anger in him. Um, and, uh, and I, I just, I couldn't catch a break. And then I went to Ape or SPX. I went to one of these things, and I met uh, uh, someone who was doing um, 
the porn comics. And sorry if I told this story on the air already, but he was working for Buttman and Hustler, and he's like, those magazines, their art directors, they have no standards and they pay the same because that's basically, you know, I went to the Tower Records uh, uh, distribution warehouse once, and it's like, here's Sports Illustrated. <laughs> Here's like all their legit magazines, and then it's like the rest of the warehouse is just bodybuilders with huge clits and you know just all porn. So back in the day when you had to buy magazines, and and they were expensive. So he's like, so this is all pre-internet, right? So I go to, uh, um, sorry if I'm all over the place. <laughs> I'm just it's like I go to. Uh, I go to uh, a newsstand, and you know the newsstand is like the part where you're not allowed to go. So I go in, into the adult section, and I and I open the first page, and I'm finding the the art director's names. So there's a guy W T Nelson at Hustler. You know, I write his name, and then the guy's like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And I just run out of there. So I go <laughs> home. I make um, I make color copies of uh, Superman fucking Lois Lane in half. Midgets fucking like obese people, just like just disgusting art that would not be elegant or for Playboy, you know. And I send it these packages to all them, you know, butt fever, like, you know, everything. And they all write back and go, when when do you want to start? You know, when do you want to work? And they were paying like two hundred bucks an illustration or something like that. And uh, I remember. Uh, you guys got to remind me. Did I tell you guys this story again? Because I don't want to. We we uh, spoke we spoke about it because because uh, I I had a connection with that W T Nelson dude when I was a teenager, right. bef- when I was still in high school, and the the oh, way nice. the way that I connected was uh, there was that. Do you remember that book? It was called like the Artist Market, and it would come out every year, and it would just have all the galleries across the country, and it would yeah. have it would have the the um, art directors at all the magazines, but they would pad it out so like right. it would be every magazine under the. Larry Flint umbrella would have its own thing. So like I was, right. I was just 17. Uh, and right. I, I sent to, um, big brother magazine or like, yeah, yeah. or like something else that was like benign that, um, Larry right. Flint published. And then WT Nelson hit me up. He's like, he's like, you're too good for big brother magazine. I think he had like a Southern right. twang. I forget. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're too, you're too good for, for uh, big brother magazine, man. And you shouldn't be doing these like, uh, the the cartoons in in hustle because we just pay like a hundred dollars like you need to do the two page spread yeah. and and like the guys who were doing those two page spreads and stuff Jaime Hernandez was doing that shit yeah. the the letters page was um it was a gouache Dan Klaus painting oh yeah when you, when you go when you go back like you know this is twenty plus years you're like oh shit like Dan Klaus like all these guys that you like were doing these and sometimes changing their name right <laughs> and uh, so my first wasn't WT Nelson. I ended up there because I did all this work for a different one where I, you know, that's a long story. But basically she asked me, the art director there asked me, hey, your art is so perverted and gross. Like, do you know other, specifically, do you know any women who write, are like horny and write horny stories? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I didn't, you know, um, but I, I just changed my name to like Suzy Suzuki or something. And I wrote all these stories of how, I'm getting sexually molested and, and just like disgusting stories. And she's like, I love these stories. I have, you know, and to me, they're like so fake. I'm like, it's so obvious. This is not real. And she's like, I have to meet your friend, Susie Suzuki. And that, that wasn't the name, but you know, it was like Trisha haunt. They were the most racist names. I could think of. <laughs> um, so then she, I go, I go, are you kidding me? It's me. Like, I, I'm like, I don't know. There's no one named Susie Suzuki. And she was so offended. And she goes, we might be filth and porn, but we print the truth. I was like, really? <laughs> so she's like, none of your art. Take it back. And I took that whole package. I was so, I, I thought I was going to have like a two, $300 payday. And I was like, ah, fuck. So I took it and I used to live right down the street from the Hustler building. So I skateboarded with all this shit. And then I went up, you know, I'm like, dude, I'm going to go into the Hustler building. It was like the Simpsons, like when they're like going into the Mad Magazine building. It's just an office building. There's nothing, you know? And I go to the floor, and, and, and W.T. Nelson's there, and he's like, yeah, this is weird, bro. Like, people just send shit in. They don't bring it in, like, in person. And he looked at it, and he's like, dude, well, you know, we'll use this one for Asian fever. We'll use this one. And we're just sitting there awkward, and he's like, I don't know. You want some porn? And I said, yeah. So he loaded up me with, like, two giant 
fucking boxes of porn, gave me a Hustler t-shirt that I, I still think I have. And, uh, and at the time I had a 19, I had my art up at a, uh, at a ice cream shop in, on Melrose that I, I couldn't, I couldn't get my art anywhere. So it's like this lady gave me a shot and I would sell a painting here or there, always like 50 bucks or, or a skateboard. And one day, um, um, a guy and you know my self-esteem was so low i was like I, you know i just I, I couldn't sell any art I, in my mind i'm like i'm the best and then i'm like oh i'm a piece of shit i'm the worst so i was like going back and forth and then um one day there was a a guy that said i'll trade you a, a car for one of your paintings and it was you know it was a piece of shit car but in my mind the it meant more like the you know it symbolically I create something with my hand and I give it to you and you give me an automobile. Like what a great story. I mean, it was a piece of sh I mean, the thing was a fucking metal death trap coffin. I mean, it, the, there was no, the brake uh, line was every day I had to go into pet boys and shoplift brake fuel and fill it up. And then on the way home, my car almost would hit every car and I would be pumping it. And then, you know, I'm an idiot. I'm a dumb artist. I don't know shit about cars. I'd have to, they're like, so your, your plan is, steal brake fluid every day and hope you don't kill somebody you know so i'm sitting there and i'm like i'm stealing brake fluid i'm stealing um dinner at ralph's like porn people are mad at me i'm getting these like gigs at giant robot advice but they're not paying any money and i was like and and and, and you know part of me is wow like it's true like the, the life of an artist is really like a starving artist you know like you're but then a part of me was like because I, I, the thing is, I did get a job at an advertising agency that was going to pay me good money. Except I just didn't want to be someone's slave and draw other people's shit. And that guy kind of laughed at me when I quit. And I said, okay, you know what? If my life is couch surfing and shoplifting food, like, I accept it. As long as I get to just draw whatever I want, you know? And as I'm having, like, this really, like, down low point, I get to my car. It's a 1966 uh, uh, Plymouth Fury brown it, you know, it looks like a cop car and there's a note on my car and it says, do you want your car to be in a, you know, period piece move? It's a very LA thing. This thing doesn't usually have, we need, we need cars from the sixties for, for this movie. And, um, and it had the phone number and it said, we pay 500 bucks a day. And I was like, what, what the fuck, dude, this car is going to make me money. So, um, they said, just drive to this set tomorrow and then we're going to put like the fake you know plates on it and make it so i drive down the street and the whole street is dressed to make it look you know there's people walking down down wearing you know period clothes and i get there and they're like your car's going to be undercover car you know so they start taking the and i go what's what's this movie and i see johnny depp come out and go it's blow it's uh it's like all the all the undercover cop cars are coming to grab him and i had never I'd never seen him before in real life and he's really short and he was like awesome. He was like going out, shaking hands with everybody. And the guy who was dressing my car, the set decorator, there's always a guy on set that's wearing a kilt. So he's wearing a kilt and like he had a le big leather <laughs> thing and he looks at my back seat and it's filled with <laughs> boxes of pornography, butt man, uh, hustler, Asian fever, like chicks with dicks, everything, you know? And he's like, and he screams it out. He's like, this guy's got a shitload of porn. And, and like all those sound guys, the lighting guys, they come. I go, you guys take whatever you want. And I'm like, maybe this is my end with Johnny Depp, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so, and the, the Johnny was a, 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 like, not like a guy who eats in his dresser. He's part, he's like down with the, the, the common man. So that was the thing. He's like, Johnny's so cool. He eats with everyone else at the craft service table. So I, you know, I they used my car for two days, so I got a thousand bucks, and I'm just like fucking taking as many doggy bags of food, and I'm like, oh, Johnny Depp is wearing like a fake blonde ponytail, and he's like two tables away. Um, I just go to my car and I grab like as much porn as I as I can, and I go, hey, bro, like <laughs> I don't know if this is cool or whatever, but and he was like, and he and it was like all asshole fever, butt fever, and, and he just opens and he goes. A lot of butts, right? <laughs> that was it. That's the only time I ever talked to him. <laughs> and he, he's like, he was like, thanks, but no thanks. So I'm like, okay. So now I'm, now I'm like hoarding all this like 
buffet food. Um, I'm trying to get as much bang for my buck. I, I'm disgusting. Like I got like doggy bags full of food. I'm eating, and I got another giant handful of like magazines and VHS tapes. And they're like, "Yeah, we're done with the shot. You could take your car." And I'm walking out, and I see uh, the the trailers, and I see the name Paul Rubens, and I was like, "No fucking way! No fucking way!" And I almost had like an out of body experience because it's like, "Okay, cool. I got to meet Johnny Depp." 21 Jump Street, whatever, but Pee Wee Herman changed my life. I mean, Pee Wee Herman is fucking Pee Wee Herman, and like, I cried when I just found out he died uh, last year, you know, and I just, I was like, you know, and he had already been caught for that masturbation scandal, and I, I didn't care. I was like, so what? I was like, who cares? My God jerks off once in a while. I don't care, you know, and I just... I was like, that guy, you know, as a kid, I just watched it because I liked it. But then as I grew up and I was like, fuck, man, using like all the artists that he did, the, the, the fucking opening credits, the puppets. I mean, that's a real artist. Like he brought art into like the same way I talk about Baron's story. Pee Wee Herman made me think I could do anything. Right. I was like, oh, my God. And so <laughs> I go, he's probably like a really horny dude because he, he jerks off in movie theaters. And I just, like, left the porn that Johnny Depp didn't take on his, like, I didn't knock on his door or anything. I just put it in front of his stairs, and I left a note saying, hey, ho this is from a fan. I hope you like it. And then, um, sorry if this story's all over the fucking place. Uh, cut to two decades later, um, I get a call from David Arquette. Sorry if this is, like, the most name-droppy, douchey story ever. I get a call from David Arquette that says, I just saw you on on Anthony Bourdain's, you know, Koreatown episode where you take him a sizzler. He's like, I'm from L.A. I used to tag in a crew called KGB. I'm a graffiti guy, and I kind of knew that already. And he goes, I'm celebrating my, it was either his 40th or 50th birthday, and I'm going to have it at Sizzler. And almost all the Sizzlers are, like, out of business now. So I think they opened one for him. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I don't know you. I like some of your movies. Yeah, sure, whatever. So I go... And he seats me at a table with Pee Wee Herman and Sasha Baron Cohen. And I'm sitting there going, do I tell him this story? or?" Do I? <laughs> and I said, hey, uh, do you remember a couple decades ago when you did this movie, Blow? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, did you ever open your uh, door and see <laughs> the stack of porn? <laughs> and he, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good uh, lie detector. I, I, he said... No, but I think he did. And then, uh, <laughs> um, we we met, and then you know we weren't we weren't close, but I got to get his number, and we, we talked a little bit, and I got to like just tell him how much I loved him, and uh, he was almost on my show. Uh, but um, I know you asked me about Baron's story, and I don't know how the fuck you asked me about Baron's story, and you asked me about what. Well, I hung out with New York, and then I just told you the douchiest Hollywood story about. It. We're going all over the place, man. And in fact, I'm I'm, I'm building toward the uh, in uh, in my own listening. I'm, I'm building toward the DVD A S A episode where David Arquette is on there. I'm very uh, curious to oh, yeah, to hear yeah. what you guys are talking about. <laughs> you heard that one yet? Not yet. Or... Building to it, man. Like I, I'm I'm still okay. in the single digits because this thing about an hour okay. and a half long. I listened to him while working, but I did uh, pop on the one where you guys are at uh, San, San Diego Comic Con and immediately riv riveting because within the first couple of seconds you're like okay man there's probably like a thousand a hundred thousand people here it's still semi-early-ish yeah. how many of these people yeah. are pedophiles like like uh, let's let's uh, do an over under <laughs> bet and stuff and like people are like raising well, their hands and shit look i mean I'll, I'll always be the first one to like make fun of myself i'm not trying to like you know but you've been to you've been to the comic cons in japan like some of those people should be locked up, right? Like, in, in, yeah, I, t like, I, I told the story that there was literally I mean, they're, dudes they're, and like who, who the comic that they're presenting and they're sitting at their table. It's right. uh, it's definitely completely illegal in the United States for sure. Any documentary about people who read comics, who collect comics, who collect comic art, I'm watching that. You know, like I know the top at this point. Partly, you guys are responsible, but I know the top comic book art collectors. I mean, these guys are multimillionaires and. I would watch a movie about them. They're the fucking weirdest people, you know, and also very sweet. And, you know, I, I like that we're in a uh, time now where the dopest, the best comic book artists that I like are getting fine art prices, you know? 
like Dan Clouds is charging a hundred grand for, you know, that's unheard of, right? Just in the last two decades, it's gone from like, oh, that was like a couple hundred bucks, and now it's like six figures, sometimes millions, right? And so someone's like telling me, you know, at a convention, um, Adam Hughes is charging twelve thousand dollars for, you know, soft core Batgirl, sketch, you know, and I love Adam Hughes, but I'm not spending twelve thousand dollars on, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, cheesecake, soft core, you know, poison ivy, tits covered with ivy. But I definitely, definitely want to see a picture of the guy that's buying that, and I want to know his <laughs> entire life story. And look, I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm a pioneer, but back in back when I was doing DVD ASA, it was like I knew Joe Rogan. Kevin Smith was doing uh, uh, Batman on Batman. Yeah, yeah Smodcast. All, all those things have been deleted, by the way. <laughs> like Kevin Smith deleted my interview when Joe Rogan went to Spotify. I think the early, like I'd been on a show like six or seven times. They got rid of all the early ones where I'm, I'm just talking about porn and disgusting shit the whole time. But yeah, back in the, back in the day, we were like, let's go mobile. Let's go to Comic-Con. Let's do, and it was, you know, I'm trying to be entertaining while all these people are, are walking around, but I'm bringing Asa Akira, who at the time is one of the biggest porn stars, and these guys are just standing around the table with, like, hiding their boners, or, <laughs> you know, they got, you know, they're, like, got their hands in their pockets, and Asa, she's, she loves it, and she starts making out with all the girls, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure we're going to get kicked out of here. I mean, like, girls are taking their tits, I mean, things just, things just got out of hand, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, I don't know what the answer to that is. I just know that, um, I love comic books. I love the comic book art community. And, uh, yeah, I mean, when you go to a country like Japan and there's like a special section just for pedophile comics and you're like, gross, kill these people, put them in jail. The other side of me is I'd rather they do that than actually do the real thing. Right. Right. So you could be like, fuck, you know, it's like, yes, that's disgusting, that's whatever, but at least, please do that instead of the real thing, you know? So, I don't know. Yeah, that was just a, that was just a funny part, because, like, the, somebody put together, like, the whole compilation, you could, like, find it floating around online, so... Comic Con was the title of like one of the. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm clicking that one first. Let me see if it's a video or something, and then uh, just immediately riveting, man. When you were on Stern back back in like what 2013, 2014, whatever that was, man, and you were like, can yeah. can I be the son of Stern? And Stern is like, boy, you got three hundred million dollars. Like, I will adopt you today. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm I'm listening to this stuff. I'm like, you know, goddamn it, dude. You like, you know, you. you got your own wing of video you got your your podcast you got uh the art game like it's a it's a it's a prince of all media at the very least <laughs> thanks man and, and it's motive it's it's um you know people like to say oh this guy's fearless and yeah there's some of that's probably more stupidity but it's it's coming from a gambler's creed of get out while you're ahead you know um i like things when they end i don't like things to go on forever uh todd mcfarland that fucking liar I'm standing in front of Golden Apple in the 90s, and he's pitching us this, this, this fucking bullshit of, like, Spawn has a meter, and when it's done, Spawn's done. Here we are, fucking 2024. Why is he still here, dude? You know? I like an ending. I don't like shit to go on forever, you know? I just did this, the TV show Beef, and it won all these awards, and people are like, Beef 2, Beef 2, and I'm like, it was a good story. Like, I'm could there be a Beef 2? Sure, but wh why? Like, it was a... A full, you know, I like, like, should Dark Knight Returns ended after the first one? <laughs> like, did we need all the other stuff? So, um, like, when I try, when I do slow jams when I'm at 21 years old and it gets a zero grant and I get nominated for some awards or whatever, immediately I'm hit with fear of, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do that again. You know, that's, that's like the confidence to get it out. I was like, I'm the best, you know, and I didn't get the zero grant on the first time. I applied for it like four, four fucking times before I got it. And then, um, so I was like, did it, killed it, never need to do that again. And then people are like, yeah, dude, that shit's selling on eBay for thousands of dollars. I'm like, I'm not going to crud that up by putting out slow jams two and son of slow jams. And you know, which I've already done them. I just 
there's a lot of art that I just sit on, and then I go try stand up, and um, and I, I I I did I did stand up three times, the most fucking infection. You know, you do a comic book, you got to print it, and then you get a few letters, or you know, you don't even know if people like it to do jokes and you're just getting immediate feedback it was like the most high i've ever felt and to the point where i was like that's because i did good like as if i become a comedian like i'm gonna bomb like at some point and that's gonna feel so i'm just gonna i'm gonna say i did it three times and i'm gonna get out and then just being a fan of like broadcasting love line howard stern like npr i said i'm gonna do podcasting but i'm gonna turn it into an art form and you know, this is all in my head. This is a dialogue in my head. And I'm just going to take it into all the weird, surreal, like, you're not going to know what's real. What's, you know, and I just, and I just was like, and it's going to be the best thing you've ever heard in your life. And there's nothing else like it. And it's, it's exactly what I would want to hear. And you're going to feel scared when you, and you're going to feel, you're, you're going to get goosebumps and you're going to feel nervous. And I was like, I did it. And, and during that time was, a uh, uh, like the most out of control I was with, my gambling addiction and my mental illness was all over the place. And everyone that was on the behind the scenes side of the show was like, dude, you're, this is not good, man. You're becoming like really unhinged. And I was like, do it for ratings. <laughs> you know, um, I wanted, I wanted every episode to be, you know, I know canceled is kind of a new word now, but I wanted every, ep like every, every guest that had ever been on my show had, had asked to be it deleted the second they walked out of the studio <laughs> they said while we were there we were under your spell and we were like yeah we're fucking having real talk the second they leave and they talk to their publicists they're like cut that shit so there's only a few where i was like and i didn't care i was like i'll burn every bridge in my life to create the i'll die for my art like i i just need this to be the most extreme shit ever you know going on howard stern and you know doing like almost an hour with him and then having him tell me that I need to calm down that having my fucking hero telling I'm going too far that I better chill out was like the greatest compliment I could ever get, you know? And I was like, Oh, so you basically just told me go even harder, you know? Um, and yeah, the ones at the end that I've never aired those, like my friends are like, dude, what the fuck, dude, you know, <laughs> like what the fuck? Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty hardcore. That's for sure, man. So and, I, I jump in and then I jump out and then I jump in and I jump out. So there's a fear of like, I did it. I did a good job. I gave it all my all and now I'm done. You know, I, I, I'm never, I never, you know, I shouldn't say never. I mean, I've, I've been asked to play myself in certain movies and I always suck in the past. So when I was asked if I would try out for this TV show, same thing. And I just, I almost lost my mind. I had checked myself into a mental hospital at the end of it, but like I fucking went all in and I said, I did it. I killed it. And I, I don't need to do that again. These fucking actors are fucking crazy. You know, there's a Hollywood is a wacky world, you know? So I'm a, in, I'm a get in, do it and then get out kind of guy. So that's kind of why I guess the Prince of media thing might make sense, but it's not cause I'm yeah, it's, there's a lot of fear in there, you know. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic uh, legacy, legacy at this point because I I mean there's there's legitimately a lot of David show that I have not fucked with yet, man. And like I I don't even know where I was in 2013. Like how did I not know that this podcast was even happening? You know, like I was just once once I turned pro, it's like microcosm. Like my head's down. I'm listening to like audiobooks. Right. I'm not talking to people, so like nobody's giving me any um, recommendations and shit. I think you were on Stern right. before you did the podcast, so like if you if you pimped the podcast on that show, like I, I would immediately go to that. So there was just like no receptacle to even hear it. And then like the Vice stuff, like I remember Vice when it was the mag. Like I I don't even know when they made the transition to do video shit. Uh, so so like I still have all of that that I could check out, man. It's 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 pretty cool, man. There's a lot of material out there. That's a there's a lot of, you know, part of my personality that I've been working on for the last decade is uh, I have a lot of antisocial traits. I'm not, I don't have the actual disorder because I actually love people and I care about them deeply. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things I do now where it doesn't matter what I do. There will always be someone like, must be nice, fucking rich, just do whatever you want. I'm like, totally. 
if you look at my career, I've done whatever I wanted from the very beginning. I could do things at a more grander level now because I have some money, but it, it wasn't like, oh, I got money and now I'm doing whatever I want. It's, I did whatever I want always because I had nothing to lose, right, when I didn't have anything. And now, now that I do have money, it's like, so there was always, um, there was always like a, like a, like a judgment and a harshness and a, and, you know, and I'm talking to myself, right? There's like, when I, when I look at someone's art, I'm like, oh, this fucking pussy. Like, draw, bitch, draw. But it's like, I'm saying it about them, but I'm also saying it about myself. And so there's like this system that's set up for everything. It's like, if you get a, if you do a podcast and you got to get advertising and you got to do this, and if you get a comic book, you got to get distribution and you have to do it this way. And it, it's like, when I did my podcast, we had no advertising, right? And we try to, we put it in the health category <laughs> instead of like comedy or whatever. And same thing with my comics. When I got comics, I was like, fuck comic book stores. Who the fuck goes to comic book stores anyways? And that's why I try to, hide them in women's magazines and just put them, you know, just give them away for free. Um, Cause that, that's the, that's the message. I think a lot of artists have today is like, I gotta get paid. I gotta get paid. I got it. And it's like, why, why the fuck would anyone pay you for your art? Is it that good? It's like, yeah, well, I think it is. Well, I, I didn't, I didn't think there's a voice in my head that says you're the best, but there's another one that says no one's ever going to pay for this shit. So both those things conflicting, I would just give my art away. I just kept giving it away, and it's like the more I gave it away, it's like very biblical in a way. Everything I gave away came back to me like tenfold, but I was never like, I'm going to get rich off comics. I'm going to get rich off my illustrations. It was just like, it just, I couldn't contain it, so it had to come out and graffiti and screaming in punk bands and saying fucked up shit on the microphone, and just it just was like, I got to just get it out. It's like, and now I still do that. I never stopped doing that, but... um I guess the fear where it's taken over my life is no one kind of sees what I've been doing for the last 10 years. You know, I have TV shows that no one's ever seen. I have, I have, uh, I have, uh, books and comic books and, and art that just, I just sit on and I'm like, part of me is like goes the, um, reclusive JD Salinger. When I die, I'll re release this shit. I mean, there is something that feels so good, um, from, putting something out like you work on it and then now it's out and you're sharing it with the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I got, I got a little bit traumatized from, you know, basically Bourdain tapped me to, to, um, to, to you know, he's like, I'm not going to do this show forever. You know, he was, and, uh, he asked me if, uh, I would do a version of his show, but with art, you know, he's like, and it, it was just, be organic anyways. He's like, you already do thumbs up. You already travel. You already talk to people. You interview everybody you meet. So it would be natural for you, but just do with art. And then because of my podcast, his, uh, his production team 0.0 is .0 like, yeah, we don't care if Bourdain loves you. You need to go fuck yourself and fuck off. We'll never work with you. And I was like, but I, God tapped me to be the next guy. And so that felt shitty. And then I did, um, there's a show on vice called, black market with the late great uh michael williams rest in peace um but that was my show and we filmed two episodes of that which were like completely different than his take is more serious mine was more goofy like i'm being stupid while i'm ordering guns and drugs in miami and all this kind of stuff and yeah same thing they're like uh you know but you know for me i i i, I try to start every morning every day with gratitude and so like every horrible thing that's ever happening from prison to canceling to, you know, getting checked into mental hospitals, every single thing that has happened from that has led to bigger and better things, greater things. So I, I, I was like, fuck you. I just go, thank you. It means so much to me that, that I did something that made you so angry that you're reacting in this way. And I accept it. And it, and, and me even telling you this guys back in the day, like that's just, you know, you got to have gratitude. It would all, everything I'm saying right now would be bullshit, but I actually live it now and actually feel it. So, um, yeah, there's nothing, I'm sorry to go so hippie, but like, yeah, there's nothing that couldn't be solved with like love and communication and openness, you know?
Like, let me be uncomfortable for a little bit to see where, where this goes, you know? Is it having a family, do you think, that that changed that from, from bullshit to something you believe in now? Oh, fucking absolutely, dude. <laughs> absolutely. Like, uh, my kid's old enough now where she's like, hey, Dad. I'm like, yeah? You're the only grown-up I know that plays with toys. <laughs> and just, like, sometimes I, you know, sh- here's the sad part, right? Like, when when we were kids, you, you could dig through, you know, your couch change and get 50 cents and get some garbage pill kids or get an issue of G.I. Joe. Like, that was, you just get some change and you could afford comic books and they were at more places, they were at 7-Eleven, they were on the spinner rack, you know? And if if you're into comics now and you're a kid, you're either just reading PDF files online for free or you have to have an older brother or, or uncle or dad who's into it that you're, you're, it, it's like comics are, you know, I, I'm going to drop 500 bucks today. People ask me what I read and I'm like, I read everything. I read shit that I don't even want to read. I just, I'm addicted to comics. So I buy everything, but I also realize that's a fucking luxury that I have. It's, that's like, I'd rather spend 500 bucks a week on comics than the other shit I was doing, you know? So, um, it's, it's tough, man. I think I told you guys this before. I was at Secret Headquarters uh, buying my comic books. Like, this is right after Black Panther and Wonder Woman 1984 or whatever was out. And this guy's just in there just snapping photos of me. And I'm like, what, what? hey, why don't you ask before you just... And he's like, oh, I work for the LA Times. I'm just doing an article. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You can still fucking ask. And he goes, yeah, I'm doing a... Basically, what he was saying is like, I'm doing an article on like losers that are old, still buying comic books. But <laughs> no, he didn't stay like that. But he's like, I'm doing an article that basically, even if Black Panther makes a billion dollars, Wonder Woman or Flash or whatever the fuck makes a billion dollars, it doesn't move the needle on comic books. It's not like there's a rush of kids. Maybe a little bit on opening day, the kid will be like, Dad, buy me a Black Panther comic. They go and they're like, this shit's six bucks and it's only 15 pages or whatever. Like, so. So I sit there and I and I go, who is this for? Who the fuck is this for? And I go, comic books, and, and that's why Deadpool does so good, right? Because it's rated R. They don't even try to make it. It's like this is, if if, if you're doing, if you're a young person right now starting off in comics. Sorry if I'm go- going ranty right now, but like, first of all, just figure out who your audience is, and if your audience is like tweens, teens, kids, then go into kids' books or, or children's, you know, children's books. Like, comic books now are just, they're for adults. They're the only people that can afford it. There's no kid going, you know, little kids starting read fucking Batman right now. They're, they're just not, you know. Um, and so this would be, like, I'm the old guy now where kids, you know, all my stories are, like, antiquated. They're like, oh, you're Fed- uh, FedExing going to Kinko's, nobody even knows what those things are anymore. So one thing that I've seen, and this might even be fucking old because technology is moving so fast, is if you're really good at art and you're really trying to get started in comic books and you want to make a living doing this, you got to give it all away for free. you gotta, you got to, you know, I don't know if there's something better than Instagram, but some, some of the shit I've seen on Instagram with the slide is you could do the 10 slides. So it's like panel to panel, just do that and just, just grow an audience by giving away your shit for free. And once people really like your art and have a, a, a connection to it, then you go, hey, look, I'm going to print this. Will you guys buy it? Do a Kickstarter. Or I don't know, whatever else. Like, But all this, like, I got to get fucking paid. Like, you, no one knows who you are and you're doing a zine and you're charging 10 bucks for it. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, totally. You know? So... so Sorry, I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> That's a conversation, man. It's a we're we're we're, we're at this point where the the lines are blurred between conversation and interview, Dave. <laughs> you know, the same twenty questions, but I feel like the yeah, comic yeah. the comic shop must be open now, huh? Oh, the comic shop is def- definitely open, and it's yeah. Before, I mean, before we bounce yeah. though, like I see all this behind you. I feel like I see a Donatello blow up doll <laughs> or something, and maybe a Pikachu. Like, what is that stuff? This is me um, being trying to be prepared for my inner. This is my car, and you know, it's like when I watch you guys, I'm like, okay, 
I don't know how haphazard all this shit behind you guys is or how intentional it is, but I can see, you know, these are all like the costumes I've used in, in different shit. And I don't know. I just got like, at this point, my family knows like after I drop my kids off at school, I stop at target, get toilet paper, light bulbs, whatever. And, um, and they're like, stop, stop getting stuff for the kids. But I'm like, you know, at this point, it's like, who is this for? You know, what is it's it? A tiny, it's a tiny fucking tra- uh, cassette tape transformer. That's fifteen dollars. That's not for a kid, right? That's for me. This uh, fucking Donatello, uh, Raphael with Crane. You know, and they fucking kick each other. This shit's thirty dollars. This ain't for a kid. Who's who's buying this? I am. Like, we're living in a time of like arrested development. You're, you know, I go to fucking Disneyland. And there's, the line is long, not because of kids. There's guys with Mickey Mouse tattoos and Marvel shit. And it's like, we're living, like, our parents weren't doing this shit. Your dad wasn't waiting in front of the comic book store waiting for it to, I'm 47 fucking years old, waiting for a comic book sh- shop to open. But then this shit right here, this is going to change your life. Uh, this this is a uh, uh, kid's crayon that I, they're eight bucks. I get it in Japantown at um, Kino Kunio. Smooth Sticks, and it's a company called, and I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but you know when you draw with crayons, and it's like kind of, there's friction? These are smooth, so it's just like, I, I do uh, drawing exercises with Rody and different artists, like, where we just time, I'll send these to you guys, where it's just, it's so fucking awesome, it's, and it's my kids' crayons, and I, and I love using them. I use all her art supplies more than my, my own stuff, so... Yeah, I just got a lot of shit back here. Um, I'm just getting warmed up, dude. You guys want to <laughs> fucking end this shit already? Uh, any, any, any other questions or like what 40, else do I got here? Like four thousand, really? Got my my fucking slab turtles cover that I did that they just sent me. That was such a hard draw, too, man. Got my Batman cover, you know. Yeah. This shit I got in my car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was looking on uh, on Instagram. There's this dude. His name's uh, he does fine art out out in LA now, but it has that kind of like he's fr- he's from our culture for sure. And he was yeah. working um for his name's Alex Party. He he worked for with uh. Oh yeah, Sam- I know Alex. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he he worked with Sam Keith for a little while and stuff. So he yeah. blew my mind. He dusted off some old ass memories, man. Uh, Cause he, I guess, one of his early gigs was for that website called artcrimes.com which mm, I'm like oh man yeah. I, for, I forgot about that site and what they would do they would they would um every city every major city in the country there would be it would be links to uh, the websites that would have graffiti and stuff and then I was going yeah. back and forth with him I was like oh man do you remember cuz it was around when Vice was a magazine and stuff there was a magazine called um while you were sleeping while and you were sleeping, you life that? sucks. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, the, 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 the while you were sleeping guy, that was the way that on the east, that's how we got our fat caps for spray, spray paint cans. Yeah. And uh, the yeah. way that you do, would do it, he, he had like an astronomical fee for uh, for the cans. So, like you have to buy 100. Or, this is pre-internet, if you gave him naked Polaroids of like your girlfriend or somebody, he would like send you the fat caps for free. Like that was like the whole right. the whole model there, man. Do you ever show that up? That makes in, sense. You ever show up in that magazine or anything? I think I have something in like all those early graffiti magazines, like for sure. And Alex is a homie from back in the day. I met him at at a zine con, and we swapped zines. And I mean, it was like a completely homoerotic relationship. We were we both were in love with Katie Holmes from Dawson's Creek. <laughs> so we would write these long, like fucking letters of how much we love Katie Holmes. I'm talking about like six to 10 pages. And it's like letters of how much we love Katie Holmes. And then like fictional stories of like what it's going to be like when we're married to her drawings, whatever. And he'd send me, you know, I, ha- I have a few, I have a few pen pal shit that I'm kind of embarrassed by, but I guess I, I, you know, while we're talking about it, it's, like, you guys love comics. I know you love comics. And you love, like, all the accoutrements and everything surrounding comics. And for me, like, one of the things that I... This is all pre-internet, right? Is 
the only way you could check the temperature or the vibe of the world of comics is the letters page, right? So you have like a young George R. R. Martin writing to Fantastic Four number 17, right? And you could see this like super nerd, how much he loves it. And then you got a 16 or 18 year old Todd McFarlane writing to uh, um, uh, uh, Superman 366. And he's even cocky then. He's like, <laughs> I like this, but I didn't like this. And, and so, you know, Mike, uh, Brian Bendis used to have like a very, you know, robust letters page where I would read every letter in, in whatever indie comic he was doing. And I used to write letters like fucking crazy. Like once I moved to Oakland and I saw, oh shit, Adrian Tomine and, and Dan Klaus's PO box is on Shattuck, like right down the street. And I was like, I wonder if I just camp out in front of their PO box. Like I'll see one of them one day. And I didn't go that far, but I did like have lunch across the street and I watched for a couple hours. And I guess I did go that far, you know. <laughs> and then, and then I was like, all these dudes are just horny perverts. Like every single one of them. I'm projecting, obviously. Um, I go, I'm a horny pervert, so everyone else must be. And so I would write these super horny letters to to Klaus and Tomine, with my background in writing porn letters for you know Hustler and whatever. And they'd all be from like super hipster Asian chicks with piercings and tats, you know, and it would just, it would just go in insane depth of their artwork, but then end with how bad I wanted to suck their dicks. Um, and, and then finally, um, I think I got hooked on it when back in the day, Peter David and Gary Frank, when Gary Frank was taken over for the Hulk duties, they said the winner gets like original art and we'll, we'll, we'll print you in the comic or we'll draw you in the comic. And I got it. I forgot what issue it was, but I wrote this letter. I drew all this shit. And uh, you guys know another comic named Creed? Yeah. Trent. So, so same, like, back like in the day. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a letter in, and then he, I won the original art, so that was my first taste. Then I got the, the Gary Frank art, and, and then they drew I got to find it. I'll send it to you guys if I can find it. But they drew me in the last panel, and I was, like, so pumped about that. And then I got... Um, um, I got, uh, I got, I, I don't know which issue of optic nerve, but it's like he drew himself. Adrian told me, uh, if he watches this, I'm fucked, but he drew himself going like, what the fuck is this letter? And then like he printed the letter and I was like, this feels better than like getting my art printed. Like just these fucking crazy ass letters. And I actually liked my, my letters for like, uh, penthouse form, those kind of things more than the art that I got printed. And then the latest is, um, I was really disappointed when Daniel Warren Johnson told me his next comic was going to be wrestling. I'm like, nobody gives a shit about wrestling. And then, uh, actually this is, uh, my character pizza man, right? I have all these Batman stories that I think are awesome that DC, cause they're a bunch of pussies would never, ever let me do. So I make up this character named, P I mean, Batman's already stupid and ridiculous anyway, so might as well make it pizza man. So I got, I got this pizza man, uh, costume that I do stupid shit with. But so I, I'm like, I already know myself well enough now where I will, if I didn't draw my comic that I've been saying I'm going to draw forever during the pandemic, then it's never. So um, I asked, you know, Raphael Grandpa, Frank Quietly, Daniel Warren, I asked a bunch of people um, and they're, they're all busy. But basically, I think do a powerbomb number three is the first appearance of, I was like, <laughs> it's cool if my character's first appearance is in someone else's comic book. So, um, yeah, and that's the latest letter I got printed, I think, in issue two or something. So I'm a huge letters guy. Um, and they're, they're sometimes better when they're anonymous or under fake names. But, yeah, I've, I, I, I operate in the light. I put myself out there. But I also have a lot of shit that I've been behind the scenes under fake names and I don't get credit for, which I'm, I'm completely okay with. I just want good art and good you know, uh, craft and skill and creativity out in the world. So anything I could do to help those things happen. And so I will also make a kayfabe request. And I've done this offline. I'll say it publicly is I love both you gentlemen. And I've gotten so used to hearing your voices. You guys have broadcast voices and more than anything, it's just so apparent how much you guys love comic books and your passion for it. And like, 
it's like it's so it's so nice when someone does something because you can tell they genuinely care about it as opposed to you know guns and roses got back together because they offered them millions of dollars or frank miller did this another dark knight returns because they offered him a million you know it's still like cool okay fine i'll go check that out but when someone genuinely cares so then you have ed doing his shit you got jim doing his shit but at this point i mean even when you guys are turning the pages and you see your hands i mean as a fan it's a no-brainer and i know you guys have your own separate worlds aside from the podcast just please do a comic book together i don't know who's doing the inking i don't know who's doing the art chores I don't know if you're passing, but you guys, to me, at this point, are Eastman and Laird. You know, like, just do one comic together and just see what happens. Maybe you'll hate each other at the end of it. Maybe you won't. <laughs> but, uh, I just, I, I'm just so used to you guys as a duo now. Uh, on the broadcasting front, I would just love to see what you guys would, because it would, it would be something completely new, right? It wouldn't be you know, you guys would use your brains and come come up with something completely that neither one of you could do separately, right? So yeah, it's true. That's true. Long, long time ago, we 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 had we had an idea like that that that's just kind of still on the shelf. There were a couple other people involved too. You remember what we're talking about, man? It was one of those great ideas that that on the ride down to North Carolina. It was like eight hour thing, and it was like, yeah, you know, like that. That sounds real good. And then it sort of powdered out on the on the way back. But uh, never never say never. Never say never, man. I mean, look, I mean, going back full circle to Jeff Darrow, meeting him, like, first is, like, pinch myself. I can't believe, like, I'm talking to this guy. Second thing is, like, some time goes by. I'm like, oh, I can, I feel like I can, I don't know if he'd say the same, but I, I consider him a friend at this point. And then naturally it moves to, should we do something together? And so we've had the conversation of, like, Maybe you draw it and pass it back, and then you draw something something like that. We're open to all ideas. And at the end, I was like, I really like being your friend, and I feel like you're going to hate my guts at the end of it. So <laughs> how about we just not do that? So maybe uh, that's answering the question for you guys. But as a fan of you both, I would love to see what happens. Because I know your work separately, but what happens, you know, at this point, you're fucking finishing each other's sentences anyways. So <laughs> just would love to see that. Well, you know what I was thinking, man, is uh, you've been going to Philippines, you've been going to Portugal, all this stuff. Like, yeah, give us like a three day trip to Pittsburgh, man. Hit up, the, we'll hit up the shops and then do like a big, long day of like re record, do like a week's worth of kayfabe episodes with you in the studio, going through all the fun oh, shit. Would, yeah. I mean, for people who don't know, I've done your show like five, four or five times now. Yeah. And I've never met you guys in, in person. Yeah. It's crazy. So. Like, like there was interactions like way back in the day, but it's like never significant enough to uh, to sort of to register with like you know the SPX era, all that kind of shit, man. But um, yeah. I th I feel like I feel like yeah, I'll come Pit out there. Pittsburgh is low key. I don't think you get hassled, man. I don't think anybody will notice anything. You, right? Would you agree uh, that like people on the street they wouldn't they wouldn't be fucking with you? And oh, no, like, I don't I don't care about that. I'll go anywhere. Yeah, and I love it's, Pittsburgh. And it's uh hit those couple big comic shops spend a day there it might it might have to be a four-day thing man because it's like you got to get there you got to leave unless you catch red eyes and i don't know about you man i'm just 40 and i can't be catching red eyes uh and that fucks me up for Wait, days days after are you guys are you guys doing um comic con san diego yeah i'm i'm in the running like phantom will um they'll put names in the hat and then it's a matter of like who san diego chooses so like they put me and Klaus. Klaus will probably get it. I think he might have got it last time, and they, they want you to stutter it for, like, five years. So I think he was there last time. I forget right. when the last time Klaus was there. But if if they if they make me a guest, I'll go. But that's it, because it, it ain't well, worth it. Well, how about this shit? Well, well, if that ain't worth it, how about this shit? Kayfabe con. Hey, you know what? Like, that's no joke, because, like, there's never any good conventions here that, right. that I would, like, even right. get out of bed for. So it's like, well, I'm going to have to yeah. make it. Like, I'm going to have to be yeah. the dude to, to, like, make that convention. Uh, Do so, it yourself, man. Exactly. So, got to get the well, audience Well, I'm curious. Back. Well, yeah, that's what I was, my next question is. I'm curious, like, how has your guys' life changed since Kayfabe? Like, the audience, I mean, it, I mean, I know it's not this thing that just, it's it's still a little bit niche, even though everyone loves comics. So, it, it's, it's a, it looks to me from the outside like a slow and steady rise. 
but I mean, everyone I know that loves comics, like it's like you guys are the authority on on this shit. So, I'm not trying to freak you out with more responsibility or whatever. But what? How has your lives, guys? How have your lives changed since since doing the show and watching the the shit grow? I had to get a storage unit for uh, all the comics <laughs> that have been coming. Oh my in. god, you guys must have so much shit being sent to you. It's pretty. Oh, yeah. oh my god, that Tons. Th- th- thousands of pieces every every week for sure. But uh, you know, doing that Red Room comic, I know it ain't your thing with all the gore and all the splatter and shit. But <laughs> but but that was a legitimate experiment to see, like, okay, I got this new audience with the with the YouTube stuff. Can I sell a bunch? of this thing that will legitimately turn a ch- big chunk of people off and and we sold yeah. hundreds, hundreds of thousands of those so so it's like Amazing. well maybe with the next stuff that doesn't have those like upfront barriers to entry like maybe you sell yeah. even more so it, it's it's serving its function that that's for sure it is the 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 weird stuff is definitely like when we're on our travels we can't speak freely really like when we visit a comic shop in another town or mm-hmm. or even just like catching dinner like at, we're at a convention or something and we're just catching dinner like we can't just speak freely at the uh, dinner table really because like it's all comic people around and right like, right you know like there's that oh they thing. love to, they love to gossip yeah yeah for sure but wow. joe bring your ass to pittsburgh man we'll wait till it's uh, it's warmer because you got That's that west true. got that west coast blood in you and all that man uh but well it's either it's either i come to pittsburgh or you guys come to L.A. and I turn you into, like, L.A. douchebags where you're going around town pitching to Netflix and, you know, like... I was, I was actually, telling... Actually, I... <laughs> yeah. I was telling Jimmy, I'm like, uh-huh. you know, like, I was looking on Zillow and I could buy some... Yeah. I could be, like, house poor in, um... Yeah. In, like, L.A. And, and, like, I could definitely get a place, but, like, it will take me years to furnish it because it would take, you know, <laughs> a big chunk, big chunk of the loot. Uh, yeah, but like the only reason to do that would be for like that kind of Hollywood bullshit, you know. And I sort of I mean, like is, making as, comics, as, right? Uh, well, that was my next question. Is there uh, was is there any part of what you guys are? Because that's always kind of that's my experience now with LA people is like they'll do a comic just so that it could be pitched for a movie, and then if it's not, they just you know that's why they do four issues and then it's done. Right? Yeah, that's like, bitch ass stuff to me, man. Yeah, you don't but see too you... you don't see too much of that shit coming through on the on the channel because it's like so obvious, you know. So it's like fuck those guys, right. just trying to like use my yeah. medium as like a ste- stepping stone. They can suck the balls. Yeah, fuck those guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I'll, I'll come to Pittsburgh. Like, come to, I'll, I'll make it. Happen. Come to Pittsburgh, dude. We'll do we'll do a, a round of episodes, but also you gotta you gotta see some of these shops, dude. Because I think like you know with LA that real estate is primo right so like you don't got the biggest kind of back issue sections and stuff like this place where the the proprietors bought legitimate downtown buildings with tons of square footage like i think all right so uh, it'll get blown well definitely it'll get blown and also yeah i might end up like moving buying a house and moving next door and then being on kayfabe every episode (laughs) but i'm at a really weird place in my life now where I'm not 50 yet, but I, you know, maybe because like there's shit that people go, oh, remember on DVD I say you said this or you did this on you know this TV show, and I and I I'm not playing dumb. I just don't remember. Sure. I'm like, oh, I don't I don't even remember saying that or doing that, and so I give away shit. Like I like I have nine storage units of shit, like the giant kind that I just give away. Like I just go take it. You know, I just give away my shit constantly and then i'll go into a comic book store i'm like oh fuck cold-blooded chameleon commandos you know <laughs> and i'll buy i'll be like i think i have this and i'll buy it and then as i'm buying it i'm the guy's like you know you gave this to us like five years ago or something <laughs> so i'm like buying i'm buying my own comics back um even with clothes like i just give all my clothes away and then uh yeah same thing like i'll see a homeless guy on the street i'm like that guy has a brian ralph t-shirt on like, what the fuck are the chances of that? And I'll be like, hey, I'll give you a hundred bucks for that shirt. And then I'm like, wait, that's my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's happened, like, repeatedly where I give away all the shit and I end up just buying it back. So I'm pretty sure if I go to Pittsburgh, I'll leave with boxes and boxes of shit. I'll have to ship it home and then get home and be like, 
why did I buy this? You know? <laughs> That's what I told but, Jimmy. I like you divested yourself of like you know twenty thousand comics recently, and I'm like, I, I think Cho's buying it all back because like, he keeps sending me texts <laughs> with like a, bu- a bunch of new stuff, man. Yeah, I, my thing is okay, fine, fuck it. Like I'm keeping like, do I need to go to four comic book sh- shops today? No, but I wanna, I wanna keep these businesses alive and and yeah so if i do i do what i can you know i love comics you know are love you guys comics in any kind of order like are you able to lay your hands on some some book whenever you're like oh man frank thierry i gotta go pull, pull those punishers mm, well i've given away 90 percent of my collection so i only have like a few like you know like the like the really good shit um no, I mean, my if I send you a photo of my house, it's just complete chaos. There's no organization. Like, I, I'd have to tear up my whole house to find, like, one thing, you know? Yeah, that's the Eddie P style. J- Jim is orderly, but uh, the Eddie P style is definitely, like, just boxes of chaos. I will go crazy if I don't, because it'll be like, oh, I need the, this thing that I don't yeah. need at all. Right. And once I decide I need it, if I can't find it, it's like I will look in the same spot like five times. It'll be the right. middle of the night, and I'm like, <laughs> I've looked there already, and here I go through this box again, and I just can't, you know. You have a few of those incidents, and it's like I just can't, can't yeah. do it. Like early on, I started buying comics by like the thousands, and yeah. I, was, I was a victim of um, of their order, you know, which was disorder. Yeah. And I'm like, I could either ink a fucking page of comics, or I could push it in order. And I got to keep a roof over my head, you know, like the got to got to keep uh, the nose to the grindstone and shit. But you know what, Dave, man, we're our uh, our video has fucked up and uh, has has yeah. paused. So that might be a good enough time to uh, to to All leave right. it. Thanks so much for for, for joining us, man. And uh, next time. Uh, we got to get Uncle Jeff on the hook, man, so that we can all kind of do our international kayfabe session. Absolutely. We'll do one with Uncle Jeff, and maybe next one will be live. Maybe I'll be sitting right there next to you. Yeah, it'd be super fun, man. Dude, send some texts uh, whenever you, you buy your shit. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. Thanks for coming. All right. Thanks. Love you guys. Good seeing Thank you, Dave. You. Cheers, man. Kayfabers, we're on the road to 100,000 subscribers. Thank you very much. Make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel, hit like, uh, go play around with the bell, get that setting uh, adjusted so that you get access to all of our videos as soon as we make them live to Gem Pop. Uh, the videos are brought to you by a number of things. A part of that is the Patreon. The King Kayfabers on the Patreon get access to all of our videos before anybody else. Uh, a good number of them are hanging out with us in the live stream uh, recording session that we are streaming up privately and that gets you even earlier access to the stuff that we're talking about. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. You don't support the books. We can't make the vids, man. Uh, Jimmy, let the people know what you have on the stands and forthcoming. I have Hulk Grand Design coming out as a trade paperback in May. You can pre-order that one now wherever you pre-order comics and I appreciate those pre-orders. Let Marvel know that it is worth their while to, uh, to keep these books in print. I also have Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, and Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. Both are out and available now. These collect all of my Street Angel comics. There is a color volume of Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, and a black and white volume in Princess of Poverty. So pick your poison. They are both self-contained. Start reading at either spot. And my self-published efforts, BW Zine, 1986 Zine, and True Crime Funnies are available on JimRug.com or on Patreon.com slash JimRug. Switchblade Shorties is my latest comics effort, uh, putting the strips out daily on all of my uh, social media platforms and the cartoonist kayfabe stuff. So it's on my Instagram. There's a dedicated Switchblade Shorties Instagram. There's a Switchblade Shorties webtoon archive of all the strips where you can read them uh, pretty easily. Uh, there's also a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor, where you can read uh, way ahead. I have more than 100 strips up there on the Patreon as we speak. Red Room Crypto Killers comes out in uh, at the end of February. Uh, this is the last volume of uh, Red Room for the foreseeable future. It contains four self-contained stories. So if this is the first Red Room that you are exposed to, you can grab it without uh, the need of the other trade paperbacks. If you dig it, grab the others. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is out there. I saw I saw it online for as low as, as 48 bucks on, on Amazon. So get it while supplies last. Uh, this is a sort of like last run 
of uh, that first printing before we go to reprints. So uh, not sure quite how many of those are left uh, right now, but it's the best book I've made to date. And X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback. Uh, this is the collection of all of my X-Men Grand Design works, probably three years of work went into uh, this package. Some of those are out of print, so this is your way to get uh, access to all of those comics at once. Uh, Jimmy, there are a couple of other ways that the people can directly support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Will you let those people know? You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. A bunch of different ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. 